All right, it's about 10 minutes into the study. Let's jump right into the Romans 14 unplugged feast and fast and food. Oh my. I wrote a commentary. It is available on my website at tatesitor.com entitled the Romans 14 unplugged. And we've been working our way down through this introductory section using some com- some um, supplementary material as well. I, we used some information from Dr. David Stern who wrote the uh, Complete Jewish Bible. We looked at his uh, commentary uh, about a week or two ago. I think it was two weeks ago or so. And and now we started looking at some supplemental material from Tim Haig, one of my favorite go-to authors on uh, resources. And tonight we're going to continue working our way through Tim Haig. Eventually, we'll work our way back around to work uh, going through the conclusion section, like you can see on my screen, um, once we uh, finish looking at the supplemental material, the additional material. So let's turn over again to Tim Haig and pick up where we left off last week. We'll probably go this week and maybe next week and maybe the week after and then we'll come back around to my own commentary. Tim Haig's got a lot of information here I want to share with us. He wrote a commentary to the book of Matthew and so that's where I'm pulling some of this information from. I'll flash a little graphic on the screen where you can see Tim's face and some of his resources. His own website is a is, uh, TorahResource.com, and from there you can purchase his Matthew commentary online um, at, uh, at his online uh, bookstore there. And you can download a PDF copy like I've got on my computer right here, or I think there's a you can get the hard copy book that you can have mailed out to you. But let's pick up this commentary where I left off here last week. We're talking about understand, excuse me, understanding and appreciating how when Paul wrote the letter to Romans, right, the letter that we have now in our, in our New Testament Bibles, he wrote to a real-life community, Jews and Gentiles in Messiah, the brothers that we keep talking about, the smaller group of immediate recipients of his letter. But among a, of, among a, um, topics that were of his interest, I mean, there's uh, the, the, the letter itself is so chock full of, of valuable information that, um, you know, it just takes years to go through it um, and appreciate the, all the wealth of information that, that Paul left for us and that the Holy Spirit superintended. But one of the topics that rises to the forefront that we should be aware of that many of us are not because we're lost in the systematic theological aspect of this letter is the fact that for Paul, he wrote to Jews and Gentiles and Messiah who were um, framed against the backdrop of a larger covenant community known as Israel. So for Paul, the smaller group of Jews and Gentiles known as the body of Messiah, variously known as the remnant Israel, variously known as the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, um, you know, the Christians, this group was framed against the already existing group of covenant members known as Israel. Now at this point in time in Paul's writing in the mid-50s of his day, covenant Israel to Paul was unbelieving um, stumbling, uh, non-believing Israel, right? They, they, they weren't, um, national Israel by and large had rejected her Messiah at this point in time. She had not accepted Yeshua. And so it pains Paul to, to try to understand the mind of God that why did she reject Yeshua? Why did she not embrace him openly? I mean, what was so, so, so displeasing about this Messiah that came, right? Of course, we can talk about that in a different study. But germane to our study here tonight, in the book of Romans and this um, this supplementary material is this idea that for Paul the kingdom of God slash heaven the kingdom of heaven slash God that the, remember that we talked about last week go back and listen to last week's um, uh, or watch last week's YouTube video go to my um, YouTube channel and click on the most recent video right there episode number 136 and listen to that um, germane to our study is that um, for Paul uh, unbelieving Israel was still God's chosen people. She was still the olive tree to which the um, uh, uh, wild olives were grafted to. She, she still represented the visible people of God in that generation. She still represented the Abrahamic uh, family to which the promises were being poured through and out from. So the church, if I can use air quotes with my fingers, you can't see them right now, um, the church was brought into proximity within Israel. And for Paul, there's this responsibility, I'm setting up the backdrop for what we're about to read, there's this responsibility of the Gentile Christian members of this family 
to continue to reach out to these now disenfranchised uh, Jewish members of Covenant Israel. Indeed, it's one big family, even though we've got some estrangement going on, even though we've got some, some um, tension going on, some friction going on because of our differences. That's the point that I'm trying to bring up and highlight in our study and that I want you to take notice of when you're reading through the book of Romans. In particular, we're reading and studying Romans chapter 14, right? That's my study. But chronologically, the letter, if you just lay it out in front of you, and this works nicely in, in, your, in the chapter breakdowns that we have for us, if we can um, accept the layout of the letter itself in front of us, then chapters 9, 10, and 11 come before chapter 14, last time I checked. That means that Paul's um, impassioned plea to unbelieving, stumbling national Israel in chapters 9 through 11 is on his mind even though he's writing chapter 14 explaining to these two groups weak and strong you're weak you know who, the brother who's weak in faith um you know welcome him but not to quarrel over his opinions uh one person believes he can eat one, anything one he, person eats only vegetables one person esteems one day as special the other esteems every day every day alike it's obvious that he's got two people groups jew and gentile in mind sometimes he's referring to brother jews and and Gentiles, they're both brother Christians, they're both Christians, and at times there's this this larger context of bro covenant brotherhood where the um, church is going to be interacting with unbelieving Jews at the synagogue level or at some of the, the, the home group meetings. Um, you remember, remember, the split between the church and the synagogue had not taken place yet when Paul wrote this letter. So Christianity was a subset of Judaism. It was a, um, a sect of Judaism is the way it's described in the New Testament. So that's our backdrop. So that was a long kind of introduction. Now we're ready to jump right into Tim Haig's uh, study. And how this impacts us with this phrase, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. And we looked at last week just kind of some of the raw data, how the phrase is very exclusive to, to Matthew, kingdom of heaven, Malkut Shemaim in the Hebrew. And yet, this carries over into the other apostolic writings, and in particular in Paul's writings, it impacts the way Paul writes. How does Paul understand this phrase, kingdom of heaven slash God, and what would he like to convey to his readership is in the importance of this phrase. That's what is of interest for us today, how it ties us back into the book of Romans. Here's what Tim Haig has to say. We're going to read some of this tonight. We won't finish it tonight. Um, we'll, we'll just kind of um, work our way through it. We pipe, we'll most definitely pick this up next week and maybe in the week after, and then we'll um, jump over, back over to my own study. Here's what Tim has to say. As you can see on my screen, starting at the highlighted section. It is clear then when we take a survey of the kingdom language in the Apostolic Scriptures, the, the New Testament, that the kingdom of heaven is indeed, quote, already and not yet, end quote. Now let me pause. For Paul, when he read through his own Tanakh, his own prophetic scriptures, he realized that God had made promises to corporate Israel that had not yet come to pass yet in their fullest sense. And yet, at the same time, at the arrival of Messiah Yeshua in, in Paul's time, right in the first century, the promises that he read about were being actualized right before his very eyes, and yet not in their fullest sense. So we could say we had the earnest of them. We had the down payment. We had the, the, um, uh, the beginnings of the end. Uh, I, I heard one pastor say it this way, the future had invaded the present. How's that for a kind of a sci-fi title, right? Uh, the future invades the present. In Paul's day, when he read through the scriptures, with, when he read through his um, apostolic, I'm sorry, when he read through his prophet, prophetic promises, he realized that there were these great and grand kingdom of heaven promises that were um, given to Israel of old, the inclusion of the Gentiles, the blessing of of Israel to the nations, the uh, proliferation of the knowledge of God throughout the earth, and the the um, the uh, the what do we say? The going forth of Torah, like we read about in Isaiah chapter two. All of that were was was a a, 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 a package of glorious promises that, for Paul and for others like him in his day, they read those with anticipation that someday this would come to pass. And yet, with the arrival of Messiah, with the coming of Yeshua into the world, the promises were actually being actualized on an individual level, but not at a corporate level yet. So the future wasn't so far away. The end times had already begun, and yet they had not come to their fullness. So there, there's now and not yet aspect. That's what I mean by uh, the future is here already, but it's not yet here. 
It's here in seminal form, in seed form. It's here in individual form, right? Individuals are enjoying the fullness, particularly with the Gentiles coming in to um, the promises of God and joining Israel and joining the people of God and uh, partaking of the Spirit of God and, and the covenants of God and the, the, you know enjoying even the, the commandments of God. All of this indicated that the end is here. The end, uh, I'm sorry, the end is here. That sounds so apocalyptic, right? Um, <laughs> the end times are upon us. And not in a bad way, but in a good way, right? So uh, we're living in the end times right now. The end times have been going on. The end of days, the achet in, in the Hebrew, the end of days has been going on for the last 2,000 years. Who would have thought that the end of days would be so long, right? We thought it was going to be like some short time period at the end of our at the end of history, but actually it's, it's been ongoing because it was initiated with the coming of Messiah into the world and the bringing in of the Gentiles near to God, and now um, we need to see Israel get on board with this end time um, uh, salvation history program. So let's keep picking up that theme. That's what we're looking at, and that's why we're studying this supplementary material. Tim Hay continues, the kingdom has arrived and that the king has come and in his coming he has accomplished all that is necessary for the complete and full realization of the reign of God upon the earth. Yet, such application of the accomplished reality is being worked out in the course of human history. That's why I said it's been 2,000 years ongoing. In each person, in each place where the righteous reign of Messiah is seen, there the kingdom of God is known, right? Yeshua's kingdom is invisible within us, and yet at the same time, there is a visible kingdom that if you read through the prophets, should be manifest soon one day. We are looking forward to the kingdom coming to earth, and yet at the same time, in Messiah, the kingdom is already within us. It's in me right now. It's in you. If you name the name of Yeshua as your Messiah, as your Lord and Savior right now, then the kingdom is in you. You don't have to wait. The kingdom is within you. And yet at the same time, when you read through your Old Testament scriptures, and you should be reading your Old Testament scriptures, then there is an aspect of the kingdom that is future. So, it's this aspect, Tim Hicks says, the fullness of his reign will be marked by the salvation of Israel. Read Romans 11.25. Remember, keep in mind that Romans 14 comes after Romans 9-11. through 11. So when Paul's writing to the weak and the strong in Romans 14, he has already written chapters 9 through 11, the idea of, of the all of tree theology and the idea that is that um, the Gentile Christians have this responsibility to reach out to the disenfranchised Jewish people and to continue to witness to them and try and bring them into a knowledge of Messiah for the sake of building up the kingdom. So in Romans 11:25 and following, we have this idea of the salvation of Israel. Tim Hague's quotes and says, for the kingdom in its most basic sense is, you ready for it? The fulfillment of the covenant promises to the covenant people. This is why it's so important in my understanding when you're reading through the book of Romans, particularly through the sections that start um, talking about Jews and Gentiles or imply that that's the audience directly like we have in Romans 14, it's so important that you keep in mind that the covenant people, even though they are unbelieving, even though they're stumbling, even though they are weak in faith, even though the Jewish people have not yet accepted Messiah, many of them are deliberating. They're still trying to decide, is he the one that we've been reading about, that we've been hoping for, that we're waiting for? Is this Yeshua of Nazareth? Is he the one? They were open to that idea. I believe those, those are the weak in faith, not people who are keeping Torah yet believe in Jesus. I don't think that's a strong uh, contextual uh, application of the weak in faith. But if we can keep in mind that when Paul's writing to the Christians in Rome, the, the brothers, the Jews and Gentiles, he always has in mind that covenant Israel is still on the program. It's not, they've not been shelved, they've not been benched, they've not been set aside, they've not been superseded by the church, they've not been replaced by the new Israel or something to that effect. The covenant promises are still um, uh, yes and amen in Messiah, and they must be actualized by Messiah. I'm not trying to suggest that uh, stumbling Israel can somehow achieve those covenant promises by circumventing Yeshua. God forbid, that's not what I'm teaching. 
They must go through Messiah. They must accept and embrace him as their Lord and Savior if they are to actualize those promises that God made to them. But the point I'm trying to make is that those covenant promises still apply to a covenant people, and Paul would under, have the Gentile Christian groups understand their role in salvation history and how they are connected to the greater covenant brotherhood of national Israel, especially when we're looking at that term brother. So let's keep reading through um, Tim Haig. The current expression of the kingdom of God for Paul, then, is likened to the first fruits which anticipates the final harvest. Understand what I mean there? Down payment. The first fruits are valid fruit. They're real. They're genuine, right? The, the, the Gentiles coming in to um, these covenant promises with Israel, they're real. They're, they're the genuine deal, right? They're, they're, they're the real deal. They're not fakes. They're real life covenant members, along with covenant na national Israel, even though they're stumbling. They are not a reasonable facsimile, but the genuine thing. Tim Hake says, yet in terms of the complete harvest, this awaits the future when Messiah returns and reigns. So Yeshua is coming back, and he's coming back to um, bring the covenant promises that God, his father, made with Israel. He's going to bring those to reality. And national Israel, even though she's stumbling right now, even though she's in a state of unbelief, even though she's rejected Yeshua one day, Paul says in Romans chapter 11, around verse 25, 26, 27, somewhere around there, all Israel shall be saved. All Israel shall be brought to her knees and brought to a place where she accepts Messiah. Whether that means every single uh, Jewish Israelite, I don't imagine that it has to mean that, but it could mean that, but I'm not banking on that. The point is, the representative group of national Israel will be known by her acceptance of Messiah one day, as, as opposed to today. Um, it's just common knowledge that Jews don't believe in Jesus, right? That's just the, the standard um, accepted point of fact if you ask rabbinic and religious Jews. Do we believe in Yeshua, Jesus? Jesus? Of course not. He's 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 uh, maybe a, 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 a savior for the Gentiles, but he's certainly not the savior for we Jews. But that's going to change someday. Let's pick up Tim Hegg's um, uh, studies once more. We'll continue reading down a little bit uh, more through this. Let me see how far I want to read. Um... Yeah, we'll read at least one more paragraph tonight, and then I think we'll um, uh, leave off and we'll pick this up again next week. Starting where it's highlighted. Tim Haig uh, continues, We must conclude then that the kingdom of heaven slash God, remember, the word heaven there is a circumlocution for God, as we noticed when we looked at the Matthew references last week. Go back and listen to episode number 136. The kingdom of heaven means the kingdom of God. It was just a polite way of saying the kingdom of God without actually using God's name or making reference to the name Elohim or Yahweh or Hashem or something. Um, so that's what we, mean, what we mean by kingdom of heaven slash God. This concept was taught by our master and his apostles as already existing yet having future dimensions as well. Again, the now yet not. The now but not yet aspect to the whole New Testament. Right? The New Testament is now and the, 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 the renewed covenant aspect is now and yet for Israel it's still future. So it's now but it's not yet. That's what we're talking about. Tim Hay continues, in terms of God's all-pervasive providence, the kingdom was assured because the king had appeared and would accomplish everything necessary to bring about the kingdom's final and full expression. Yet, the complete realization of the kingdom and all its dimensions would await the end of days. Like I said, the al Hayamim, as it's described in the Apostolic, in the, um, the, the prophetic writings. Tim Hay continues, all who would receive the king would enter the kingdom but those who reject him would be cast out. In this way, the kingdom of heaven incorporates both the physical restoration of Israel and those who would join her through faith in her reigning king, Messiah. For in the end, Israel comes to repentance on a national scale, confessing the pierced one to be their king. Did you understand the the, the um the importance of that statement that uh, Tim Haig just made there? When we're talking about the kingdom, it's so easy for us to, here in living in the modern 21st century, to think that the kingdom of heaven is just all of the Christians who have come into um, acceptance of Jesus as their Lord, and that's really all there is to it. There's, everyone else is outside, and we're the only ones that are in. And in one sense, that, that's, that is a reality. Unless you accept the king, how can you rightfully call yourself a citizen of his kingdom? But yet the reality, the mystery of it, is that Gentiles have been brought near to the existing covenant people of God, and that covenant membership for the existing people group 
is only a down payment. It's only a foretaste of what it really should be. It's a, it's, it's an earthly representation of really what should be true in the heavenlies. We who have accepted Messiah, without confusing you all, we, um, we enjoy kingdom membership at the spiritual level, at the heavenly level, at the eternal level. And yet, national unbelieving stumbling Israel, they're still citizens of the earthly kingdom that God has established with his people. Covenant membership is theirs at the national level, at the earthly level, at the temporal level, right? It's going to expire once they die, but it's supposed to lead them into a, an acceptance of covenant membership and kingdom membership at the spiritual level. It was not supposed to be exclusive, exclusive from one another. So here's the point. Paul was a national Israelite. He's a Jew by ethnicity. He's a Jew by birth. Um, that was his heritage, right? That's his upbringing. That's his, his um, um, uh, you know, his his mother and father were Jewish, therefore he's Jewish, right? Makes sense. So when Paul accepted Yeshua as Messiah, he didn't leave his national membership in Israel behind to join some new group membership known as the church or the Christians or something like that. That's the point I'm trying to make. He simply uh, embraced covenant membership for, at a personal level, and his relationship with God became personal, and he became a citizen of the kingdom of heaven at the spiritual slash heavenly level. Right? He acknowledged the spiritual king, Messiah Yeshua, but he didn't relinquish his covenant membership within national Israel. He's still a national Israelite. He's still a Jew. He's still um, a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? like he confesses. In fact, he's even still a Pharisee. And so that's the point I'm trying to make. Um, Tim Haig con concludes in his final paragraph that we'll look at tonight, and then we'll turn to our next study. The kingdom of heaven is thus neither entirely internal, that is ethical, nor external, political, or geographical, but both. For the return of Israel to her land is in conjunction with her repentance and the establishment of the covenant on her behalf. We like to sometimes imagine that it's all about the body of Messiah, and it's all about um, getting people saved, and it's all about getting people to confess Jesus as Lord, and everything is hunky-dory from there. And we often kind of just write off Israel. We just forget about them. We don't remember that the kingdom of heaven involves them. It involves bringing these covenant promises that were given to the prophets of Israel to pass through Messiah, their king. It involves bringing them into a relationship with Yeshua so that they can actualize and embrace the kingdom in its fullest sense. So it's so important as we're reading through books like uh, Romans, and particularly Romans 14, when we're talking about the weak in faith, the strong in faith, people who have these preferences, these people who have these differences, that Paul envisioned two people working together with one another, not excluding one another, not Jews on one side of the street keeping their holy days and their food restrictions, and then Gentile Christians over on the other side of the street keeping their worship days and their table fellowship rules, and the two are mutually exclusive from one another, yet they're both convinced in their own mind, right? That's not the way Paul envisioned it. That's not the kingdom of God at work. That's, uh, that's confusion. Um, Paul envisioned the family of Abraham brought together Jew and Gentile in Messiah, eventually all of us in Messiah. But even outside of Messiah, we have the national unbelieving stumbling Israel who's disenfranchised because of the uh, the uh, the edict that Emperor Claudius enacted in, in, just shortly before Paul wrote his letter that expelled many, some say all, but many um, or just a sizable amount of Jews from Rome. And then five years later, they were able to, to re-enter into Rome and start rebuilding their communities again. Either way you slice it, they are the minority in the Roman population and the Roman churches, that's to be sure. So we understand that. But the um, importance of our study is that, yes, they've been um, uh, kind of um, downsized, right? They, they, they were uh, disenfranchised, they were um, um, uh, reduced in their numbers because of that tragic uh, uh, expulsion rule. But that doesn't write them off of salvation history. That doesn't write them out of the social responsibility of Gentile Christians to continue to reach out to them, not for the purpose of turning them into Christians who have abandoned their Jewish heritage, but for the purpose of helping them to actualize the fullness of the kingdom of God as they internally embrace Messiah, their king, 
and yet await the kingdom of God to be manifest here on earth. Let's finish Tim Hague up to, uh, with this last paragraph, and then we'll turn to our next uh, part of our study. So, Israel needs to um, continue to look for the return of the king in a larger national sense. That's still on the horizon, still future. The rule and reign of God is thus seen in its fullness, Tim Hague says, when the Torah is written on the heart, not when the Torah is discarded, not when the Torah is replaced by the supposed law of Christ, not when the Torah is somehow done away with in Messiah, not when the Torah is somehow fulfilled by Jesus so that we Christians don't have to keep it anymore. None of that brings about the fullness of God's promises. Only when the Torah is written in the heart, which does what? Results in outward obedience to the word of the king. Go back and read Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 again. And you'll see this is the way that um, uh, God envisioned it. It's the way Paul understood it. It's unfortunate that the historic Christian church has inherited this theology that teaches that the law has been set aside in Messiah, relaxed by Jesus, set aside by Paul, or um, done away with, no longer under law but under grace, or something to that effect. All of that um, disrupts the kingdom promises, and it, it it, it distorts, is what the word I want to use, I don't want to say disrupts, it distorts the kingdom of heaven as the king establishes his kingdom on earth with national Israel, with the people of God, with the Gentiles brought into the picture, right? Torah is there front and center as well. Uh, and uh, Haig concludes, what is future is the national expression of this new covenant in the descendants of Jacob. That's future. Hasn't happened yet. New covenant for national Israel? Still, They're still waiting for it. New covenant for every individual on planet Earth? It's been ongoing ever since there was a man, a man on the Earth. Every person can um, uh, join new covenant, can um, embrace new covenant reality if they embrace uh, the concept of a Messiah who will personally atone for their sins, namely Yeshua of Nazareth. That's new covenant. It's not something that's time bound. It's the point I'm trying to make. People in the Old Testament were saved the same way as people in the New Testament are saved. How? By placing their faith in Messiah, whether it's the Messiah who would come or the Messiah who's already come. And uh, Tim Hicks' final uh, statement here that we'll look at tonight, the present expression of the kingdom of heaven is the believing remnant who have participated in the new covenant already as the first fruits of the eventual harvest. And that harvest is going to take place in the end. Indeed, as we're working our way through counting the Omer, we're looking at this principle in, in, in uh, effect as well. The Omer count represents the beginning of a larger harvest, the um, barley harvest, which began at Passover is going to come to its fullness in the um, in the wheat harvest at uh, Shavuot, and so we bring that first fruit, that Umr Rishit, that first barley offering to them, and we wave it before the Lord closer around the uh, uh, the time period of Passover, right? That's when the Omer count began. We bring this first barley harvest before the Lord and we wave that, that representative first fruit and we say, Lord, this represents a larger harvest 50 days in the future. And so this is kind of like the down payments, the earnest. It's, it represents the, the first part of something that's larger. And as we count our Omer, right, a one, two, three, four, five, and we count the days with this anticipation of um, landing at uh, Pentecost, 50 days in the future from Shav from uh, Passover, right, from Pesach to Pentecost, then when we reach, when we arrive at Shavuot, we have another harvest celebration, but this time it's not the, the barley harvest, it's the wheat harvest, right? So, um, I think I'm getting that right. Barley harvest up front, wheat harvest at the end. I, I believe I got that right. Sometimes I get those two confused, but I think I'm right here. I'll have to go back and look that up later. But the down payment aspect leads to the greater fulfillment. That's what's going on with Paul. He realizes that the Gentiles coming into covenant Israel represent the down payment aspect of this kingdom of God aspect as it's being um, played out before Israel's very eyes. Even though she is national, uh, even though her uh, blindness is national, even though she's stumbling, even though she's not in a place where she's received Yeshua, nevertheless, the Gentiles represent that remnant of Israel as um, that part of Israel is embracing Jesus. And that's why it's important to locate the church, so to say, within Israel and not outside of Israel. Because the church represents the down payment, the first fruits of the part of Israel that's going to eventually overtake the whole one day when all Israel shall be saved. Omain, Omain. And that'll do it for our uh, study in Romans 14, Feast and Fast and Food. 
Oh my.